Okay, we're starting the uh, second morning session, uh, which is going to be devoted to experiments. And uh, the last uh, presentation we had was from Max Pomachev Zimilov, Zimilov who, uh, whose paper won the best paper award for uh, NPA 19. And the second place for that is, is the presentation we're about to hear. Actually, there are two papers. Jeff wrote two uh, long papers, one more theoretical and one more experimental. And it was the experimental one that won the, uh, the award. But as Jeff insists, the experimental and the theoretical go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other because the, uh, the theoretical actually inspired the experimental work. And it is some pretty amazing work. And I'd like to, uh, Jeff will probably mention this, but thank John Warfield for making it possible to get this research done uh, through actually the, for the formality of the, uh, the International Science Foundation, the really found organization. So anyway, let me just tell you a little bit about Jeff. I actually met Jeff here two years ago exactly at the Tesla Tech Conference. Both of us were speakers here. And I sat down next to him and we just started talking. I don't know, it just sort of happened. And I think we spent pretty much the whole conference just kind of hanging out. It was great. We got to be good friends. And we've, uh, I don't know how many emails we've sent to each other over the last two years. Uh, I introduced him to John Warfield last year and they, they made a great connection. And through that, uh, through that work, they're working together, and John's help. Uh, a lot of this research that he's going to be presenting today was made possible. So I'd just like to introduce to you again my very good friend and great scientific researcher, Jeff Cook. Thank you, Greg. All right, so my study is largely in fields, uh, particularly the vacuum field in this experiment, um, and the paper is entirely devoted to the vacuum field. I understand there are some people that their models don't fit with the vacuum field, some works with ether, even though it's probably the same thing in my opinion. And some work with forces and just completely eliminate the fields altogether. The vacuum field though ha does have some, a lot of standard uh, scientific definitions. It is basically the sum of all fields in space. So you take all the gravitic fields, the electromagnetic, fermionic, all these fields, add them all together, and that is what equals the vacuum field. It's a little different than zero point energy. Zero point energy is the uh, energy in the ground state of any given system. The vacuum field is the supply for the ground state. Okay, so that's essentially what the vacuum field is. And uh, this is the experiment. I'll begin to show some of the motions of how the experiment came about. All right, if you take a, an inductor and uh, we have that, is this the pointer here? It won't help you because it's going to do this. Very good. Got to do it up. All right. Um, all right. So we have an inductor. The yellow region is, is simply uh, copper windings. The uh, gray area is a ferrous core, and then the white area is a hole in the middle. So essentially, it's a ring inductor. You can use the laser. I'm sorry. That's what I'm saying. You can't use it as a clicker. I'm sorry. All right. That's fine. Which button is it? The, the first top one. one. The top one. Sorry about that. You got it backwards, or? Oh, so sorry. There we go. All right. So this white region is basically a hole. It's a, it's a ring inductor. And this around here is a ring magnet perpendicular to the face of the inductor. And here is on a brass ring. Um, and here is on a brass rod. All right, with this, when you pulse this, uh, DC pulse, the magnet experiences the four motions. On a ring, it'll experience three motions. Those motions are precession, which are exactly matching the frequency of the input uh, waveform. So they are due to the E and B fields. So back and forth, back and forth. There are two additional motions, and some people say, well, maybe if you throw a ball up against the wall and it bounces back, there's an extra motion. It's a reaction to that. It is possible, except for the fact that I'm able to isolate these motions. They are independent from each other, but they all are. are they all require the precession to exist. So once the frequency matches the input then you get a couple extra motions, and I'll explain why that is. One of them is rotation. It goes up and down, up and down, but in a, in a circle, all right? And the velocity increases the closer it is inward. So the angular momentum begins to increase as you bring it inward. There's another motion where it tends to want to go around. If you put it on a rod and you fixate it, it goes back and forth. If you loosen it, it vibrates, and it expends energy through the vibration, and it doesn't move back and forth. So these need to be solidly fixed. That's essentially the motions. There are three. There's another one that's not implemented in this experiment, 
um, and its nutation where it moves to and from the center and to the outside. When it's on a rod or a ring, it is pro prohibited from going to or fro. All right, so here is, is a video of those motions. I put a line on there so you can see that it's actually rotating, precess precessing, and what I call orbit because it would tend to go around the coil. If you put it on a rod, it's going to want to go back and forth. Again, the frequency at which these motions occur are all different. So if this was pulsed at 60 hertz, if the inductor was pulsed at 60 hertz, the precession, the back and forth, forth wobble of the ring magnet would occur also at that same frequency. However, as you see, the, the orbit is a bit slower and the rotation increases as it approaches the center. Starts out slow from the edge and you bring it, move it forward. So it's completely independent from each other. All right. So that then it is the, the question arises, is, is this three motions uh, without any application of gears or mechanical advantage? manifest from a single electromagnetic field. Could it be just this oscillation? Uh, gauge theory, which is the theory that, this, that I base uh, the theoretical paper on largely, it would not allow this. A motion, a repetitive motion is an action and that is associated with a different field. So every repetitive action is associated with a different field. And handfuls of experiments, not published in this year's proceedings, I, I may be able to go through some of them. I mean, it's like, hundreds, maybe thousands of iterations of various coils. I built 12 different coils, each with uh, different increments and dimensions, all having the same nominal impedance, so therefore they all have a different inductance. Pulse it with the same power, and what happens is these motions, the angle of the lines of force change. Therefore, you can shut one motion off. The rotation can be eliminated with a certain frequency and coil dimension. The nutation can be eliminated by putting it on the uh, rod or a ring. And all of them can be eliminated or changed or all work in unison, but they are independent. Okay, the uh, three motions present in the fact involve uh, um, two additional fields. If there's two different motions, two different actions, um, repetitive motions, and those are in the abelian group, the, the unitary group involving basically we know as electrodynamics. You got your E, your E field, your A field, and your B field. Uh, some, in, some people include the uh, gravity and the uh, electrodynamics, their electrodynamic derivations for it, but in this study I will show it to be in a different group altogether. Yes, you can get from one to the other, but uh, um, the group here only includes three. The second unitary group, and I'll get more into this, involves what is called the electroweak field. It's, uh, the abbreviation is SU of uh, one or SU of two. And, uh, and then the strong, nuclear strong, which is, this is the standard model and gauge theory, puts it in the subunitary group three. All right, the abelian group is the unitary group uh, one. All the rest are subgroups. I'll get into that and it'll be explained. All right, so more on the B, A, and E before I get to the experiment. Um, physicists understand what we call a magnet. A permanent magnet is a grouping of, of three fields of force. So you have your your B field is a solenoid going around it. You have your bound electric field going around. It's from the atoms in the magnet. And you also have the A field. The A field follows kind of along the same direction as the E field in a permanent magnet, depending on the polarity. A toroid, such as the eroding coil, manifests the A field. So the A fields then are interacting around in, in a solenoidal fashion around the perimeter. And also the E field is then go, the, the coil wrappings is around that toroid. Okay, so the uh, um, B, A, and E fields manifest onto the magnet at the exact frequency input to the coil, as described. All right, so the back and forth precession matches, and it is due to B and E. A is, is responsible for the uh, nutation, which also oscillates at the frequency of the impulse, so we know that that is the A. Okay, and that's the, that's the, that would be expected. The other motions are not expected. All right, so what is causing the others? Well, first, you need to isolate them from the B and E and in order to measure, and that's when I built those 12 inductors. <coughs> and uh, I think I presented some of them on Thursday. I presented all the work on Thursday. And uh, um, so then multiple variations of the frequency and duty cycle were, were applied. In the end, altering the duty cycle affects the motions, 
but in the final experiment, it works just the same. The, the power input output is it remains the same, and I'll get to that. But basically, the the duty cycle, which is basically how long it is on, how long or how long it is high, how long it is low, changes the angle at which the fields move. So therefore, the motions will change. If they're at just right the angle, it will be very increased uh, high velocity. If they're at a wrong angle, they may push off the magnet off the uh, face of the coil. But um, the angle, the frequency, and the duty cycle and the size of the inductor all have bearing on the motions. This is one, this is the general look of one of the 12 coils. And at this point, I didn't use ring magnets for this experiment. Um, I, I use ring mag magnets for the one that's the paper, but just to give you some uh, premise. This is a disc magnet, and it would go around the face of it. And uh, I originally was going to have a magnet center that was eliminated. And, uh, um, and then we just measured using machine vision to measure the angular velocity. Therefore, more motion, more energy. So that was the initial thing, and how can we control the energy? All right, so it's me the energy was measured on that experiment from the motion alone. So those that have problems with this next experiment, with, oh, you didn't measure the DC output this way, which is all very accurate, by the way. But if they have any argument, this, this experiment is as well. More motion equals more energy. If I have two um, balls that I'm bouncing, and one is bouncing and they're equal mass, equal dimensions, one is bouncing more, it has more energy. Okay, and that's why that study was important. But that was the setup. Here is the, how it was take, that data was taken. Um, it was marked with a little cross there, and you could see it rotating uh, from the top. Precession, you could see from the side. You could see it's on an angle. And then nutation, you could also see on the top. Okay, so there's a, rotation can be measured by measuring the amount of time that that goes around in the camera. The machine vision works in black and white, so it can detect the white uh, line as opposed to the black, and then it can measure it. This is used in golf simulators, and, and the number one golf simulator company in the world is the one that uh, their, their technology was used for these measurements. So they're very, very precise. Okay. In general, this is also leading up to the final experiment that's in the paper. Each, um, each motion could be eliminated with changes in either the pulse or the physical dimension of the coil. Rotation might remain, but mutation would just about vanish. Precession was present in most iterations, um, but even that could be eliminated. Remember I said the precession matches the input frequency, but that can be eliminated as well. And uh, when it did, when all of the motions were eliminated, there was partial levitation. It didn't know where to move. Here we go. Uh, let's see. I'm going to skip through. Oops. Try to skip one. My cursor. Here we go. <coughs> Just going to show some of the. Uh, that's what it looks like from the top. You can't really see it. That's why I took some other shots from the, as soon as I hit the mouse, it goes to the next slide. Okay, interesting. I get it, don't worry. I wanna show it to you. I'm just gonna go right here. And, and it's still flipping, but you can see at some points it's kind of like a fish jumping out of the water. And uh, you can see it's not really rotating, it is. I, I did my frequency um, in, in iterations of five, so 45 hertz, 50 hertz. It's the optimum frequency you can get it completely flat is somewhere in a fraction, somewhere in between like 47.13 or whatever, something like that. But so there is still a little bit of rotation there. You see it's wanting to go around, but in general it's, it's not. So that's. I can get forward to the top when I took off the top. There we go. Okay, so here, here you will see this is what we call partial levitation. Um, just watch this. That where it's kind of doing it's wanting to precess in the air. Doesn't know where to go. All the motions have been shut off, but it still has energy there. But it's just kind of flipping and, and random. And this is just one of the results of, of how the frequency input can change the motion of the magnet. All right, let's go to the next. All right. 
It's all isolation, isolated motions due to the dimensional frequency changes alone strongly suggested that isolated, there are isolated fields of force, that there are other forces or fields of force present in the system. If such fields could be isolated, then multiple fields are being manifested and could also feel isolated. If and only if the energy of the ground state of the system were truly being altered. What does that mean? If there are multiple fields in the system, the energy ground state is higher. Energy ground state is higher, more zero point energy. Therefore, it is then extracting from the vacuum field, applying it to the system. This raised the hypothesis that if the ground state were higher, when more fields are present, then efficiency of the system should increase. And, uh, well, it says to explain, but I'm going to show it. All right. By adding multiple magnets on there, then I should be able to increase the efficiency linearly, right? You add one and you get X, you, an increase in the ground state. Adding two should do the same thing. Adding three should be doing the same thing. And each of the energies are being applied. Therefore, the energy of the system, it would go up. That's the theory. And if that is the case, if, if it were to do that, then I thought it would increase linearly rather than taping off at some unity. So if, if it were s simply unity, it'd kind of go up and then it'd taper off at like 80%, 90% as typical motors or typical engines today. If each, adding each new magnet would increase the, linear, uh, the efficiency linearly, then it would go up and it would go above 100% efficient, okay? And could anything other than the vacuum field and along with it, the infinite amount of energy that the vacuum field has do this? And uh, Probably not. There, there's no laws of physics other than the vacuum field, which scientists understand to have an infinite amount of energy, <coughs> albeit a small amount, a small action. It means it can be very weak. However, if it's required that energy is available to the system, if the system is magnet, then the action becomes very strong because the forces of magnets are very strong. Okay, so where in the field could this vacuum field be manifested? Where is it coming from in the magnets? Well. Um, relativity requires the zero point energy in order to derive the magnetic fields. In order to derive the electric field, it requires the zero point energy. Okay, and uh, and I, I know a lot of people's feelings on relativity, but he's not the only one. Quantum physics also requires it. Okay, so the fields alone need to be involved with the the zero point energy, and it also needs to be affiliated with the vacuum field. So what I have, uh, and remember, the, the Z field I call the vacuum field. Not the ZP, which is the ground state. Okay. So this is where I found it in the H component. And I'll show you how it, it's found and how it can be used. Uh, H in Maxwell's equation, H is some people call mag magnetic force, the, the, that which is responsible for inducing electricity, that for inducing uh, magnetic flux and permeable materials, is the H component, which is typically considered just the field. Which it actually has two parts in conventional science. It is where the applied magnetic field plus a demagnetizing field equals that field. Okay? I, I found too that it has two parts and it can be expressed in a different way. Um, yes, okay, so the uh, oh yeah. I have found that it, with the derivation, and I'll show that really quick because it's not the paper. But here's what you get, is that H is a product of, um, it, it can equal this, you take this equation, which is the standard, the definition, and we're going to ex extract these units. And, and if you see the title of the paper, it's a unit derivation. So the units of measurement, we're going to extract them to see really what else is H, what, how else can we define H other than coulombs per second per meter. There are other mathematical ways to express H, which give insight to what H is created from. And so we start doing this, we expand. The B field is in kilograms per charge, or per coulomb per second. Permeability of free space, and this can be expanded out here in this, into this way. It's often, most often expressed in a simpler way, but what we're doing is, is it's going to, leading to something, okay? Other than just Henry's per meter, which is what is typically referred to. I wanna get it down to, so we can just use kilograms, uh, meters, seconds, or uh, coulombs, all right? So, taking the typical definition of a frequency of an inductor, which you got L as inductance and, and um, the C is capacitance, we get C out from here. This is the equivalent, this is the dimensions of uh, capacitance. 
and you can then just solve for the uh, inductance in, in the, the units here, and that, that's how you get the uh, permeability in those dimensions, okay? If anyone has questions on how to do that, or it's not really clear from this, feel free to speak with me. All right, such that that equation, the, the standard equation, comes out in those, these dimensions, which we saw earlier, also can be expre expressed in kilograms, you know, squared, meters cubed, coulombs to the minus three, seconds to the minus five. So, well, that's very big and clunky. Well, it actually amounts to the product of two fields of force. And uh, um, thus, so too does the magnetic dipole moment, as well as the H field at the poles. The H component is a product of two fields of force coming out of the pole. Well, we know the bound electric field is going around. We know the A field is going around. We know the B field is coming out as a solenoid. Where is the missing field that makes the product? Well, there's two. Oops, first, yeah. First, I want to show the, the definition of the field, which is in the, and we'll do this later. All right. There are fields that can be like the displacement uh, current or displacement, well, what is it? It's like D, Maxwell's equations, D, it's a. Uh, displacement current? Yeah, I think it's displacement current. Okay. This is considered a field, okay, in mathematics, okay, but it is different from a field of force. In this definition, a field of force can be broken down in the same way that the dimensions of force can be broken down. Force is in kilograms um, times distance per second to the, uh, to the minus two, all right? Other than that, mass times acceler acceleration. What that means is force is how much a given mass travels in a certain distance in a straight line per time squared. Field of force can be described in the same way. How the measurement of the amount of space, r to some power, like a balloon can actually expand the three dimensions, right? So it could be r to the three. Force is just measured in a straight line. Field, on the other hand, field of force can be measured to r to some power of a given mass, only m to the power of one, or just m, having a certain amount of electric charge, e to some power, therefore it can be Coulomb squared or, you know, cool just charge. How much it moves transverses from a field of force in a certain amount of time, t to some power. Okay, so very big de description, but all fields of force that we know today fit into this definition. The B field, the E field, the A field, even gravity, electroweak, and strong field all fit into this definition. With that, then it means if there are any other fields of force, they also should fit into this definition. Displacement current does not. And I'll show it here. There's two groups of fields. And uh, there are the symmetric fields, which is in the abelian group, the electric weak, strong field, magnetic, all of those, but there's another group. And the symmetric ones fit into this group. And they can be calculated. So therefore, we, if we want to have B, B is in here, is M. No distance in there. It would be so. It'd be r to the minus zero, or r to the um, uh, r to the power of zero. It amounts to one, so it has no bearing on the dimensions. Charge to the minus one, time to the minus one. That would equal the B field. The E field. How does that fit in there? Mass times time to the minus one, uh, charge to the minus one, and distance. Oh, that's incorrect. <laughs> distance to one, not to the minus one, sorry, that's a typo. Okay, these others, all of them, A field fits in there too, so they all have that, and such that these conditions are met, so that A is greater than, or equal to B, which is also greater than A minus two, and B here is greater or equal to C, which is greater than B minus two. If you follow that, you can define every single field of force in of, that is symmetric. Basically, anything that quantum physics describes can be fit into here. There is another group, and this is where some of the relativistic um, fields come about, and uh, some of them are very commonly known, actually. Um, but here's a little bit different, okay? So this is the formula for the, this. These fit into a group called the Lee fields, all right? This is a, a gauge theory, and a standard model refers to that in some senses. And these would can only be calculated topologically. Okay, they don't represent smooth manifolds. Uh, uh, this, if this were a bubble, 
this would be the air in between many different bubbles. Okay, that's the way to describe it. So you can map them from that, but they cannot be measured with differential calculus. All right, so what is H? If you take just this, it equals, it can equal the E field times the electric weak field. That would produce the product of H. Or H can also equal the Z field, the vacuum field, which will be good then to shown as in, measured in kilograms per second, times some other field, which we'll get to, some other field, unknown, but can be calculated, and it is, a, um, it is also in the Lie group of fields. So it's a X9, X sub nine. Okay, so it is product of two, of two, uh, um, two parts. In this way, it can be represented as one field times another, or the demagnetizing field plus the applied magnetic field. Either way works perfectly. And then the paper is how I prove it, the, that the vacuum field is in a very simple dimensional unit, kilogram per second, the vacuum field. How I did it? I considered each field a space, uniqueness dependent on a series, and thus used topology to map one to the other. The series is very simple. You got those three, remember we saw the A, B, and C, all right? So we have the series, and this is the way it goes, ultra simple, it goes A increases by one, then B increases by one, then C increases by one, and then it goes back to A increases by one. Then, well, you could raise that series to an infinite series, and, uh, and it, it got the sum, and then you can take all of the fields, this is the Lie group fields, including B field, A field, E field, and add them all together, and it will give you a value. You can take all of the topological fields then and add them all together and it will give you a value. All fields yet un undiscovered and the, including those that we do know about. So there are many other fields that, that may be present and those may be defined as simply the various combinations of the magnetic field and B field and E field, but they get more complex. You get atoms grouping together, that's a more complex field and that's how they can, all the dimensions can fit. You take them and Conventional science says if we do so, then all of these plus all of these should give the value of the vacuum field. It is the sum of all fields in space. So here's how we did it. The unitary groups, I just discussed the Abelian group. Am I close to half hour point? Does anyone know? Uh, 27 minutes. Perfect. All right, we're just getting to the experiment and how that applies. All right, so these groups, you got the Abelian group. And you get the subunitary group one, subunitary group two, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, I express them all as U. Uh, standard model uses S, S view for anything other than the Abelian group. But basically, then, with topology, it's very useful to make a, um, to use the product. Then you can start to map that to the sum, and then you can map one field to the other. So I can map B field to, to E field, so on and so forth. So this equation then takes, if you multiply, you add up the first three. B field plus A field plus E field, and then you add up the next three, the electroweak times whatever fields in that group. There's three to each group, and, and this is, is so it's modular, it goes like a clock. And uh, um, you take them, and then you multiply those groups of three all the way to infinity, and it equals zero. Does that mean that you sum them all, then it equals zero? No, it means it, you can actually, and then I use actual values too, so you can do these calculations from the paper. Essentially, what that says is it gives us a number to work from zero. Then we can change other things, apply it to different situations. Interestingly enough, with this configuration, you can take all the topological fields and reduce them to zero in a, it, pretty much the same way. It's a little bit different for the, uh, these, uh, the n minus three rather than see that. So, um, but basically, w when doing that, topologically, we can then map anything, any topological field into the group of symmetric fields, the Lie fields, okay? And, and this is all in the paper on how it's done one step at a time. I'm showing the results largely. All right, so therefore, any field, a topological field not consisting of a smooth manifold can be mapped, it means we know where it is, to any Lie field. And Z field, the vacuum field, whatever it is, it's definitely the sum of all the fields, can be mapped to any of the fields that we know. Once we know how to map them, we can apply experiments to them because the numbers will pop out and say, if we give this amount of energy, then this is going to do this, all right? Or any other symmetric field. Where gravity fits in, um, interestingly enough, if you take that function, you get the, uh, 
mass as a field itself. Its action is acceleration, which is identically reversed to what Einstein would say. He would say the field is acceleration and mass is that which interacts with it. Does it matter to me which is the other? No. But here in this, it, it maps out. So basically, standard model has this group defined, this group defined, and the next group defined, the strong nuclears over here. It does not include anything beyond there, and it does not include anything this way. We get the Z field in the center, which is a result of the calculations you can go through it, and we get this nice little grouping of all the fields that is even more organized than the periodic table. It's every field we'll ever need to know is in here and can be mapped. Below here are its dimensional, its unit dimensions. And uh, we, at this point in the paper, I've not proved that that's the vacuum field, just that that field has the dimensions of kilograms per second. This is how they group. This is what they call, um, well, it kind of glues. All right, so let me describe topology. All right, if you have a space, all right, it can fit within another space, and they can be grouped from all these spaces connected together, and in the end, it's still one space, right? So that's how they all fit in. If you consider fields, remember the definition was the amount of space that a given mass can travel on and so forth. In the end, it amounts to amount of space, all right? So if you take these spaces and you topologically describe them and then map them and group them, still amounts to an entire space. That entire space of the sum of them all is the universe, is the vacuum, okay? And this is how it's done mathematically, how it maps. These groups then are each modular to three. Each group has three fields, B, A, E, N, I call, and they all, then there's this torsion field, which some people describe, which is what the experiment implements. And, and then the electroweak field, and then the strongs over here. What you get then here is Z field is the first in the uh, unitary sub Y group. The Z field is there, but it also has an extra property that it connects the two. It glues them, topologists call that. Glues the, two, glues the two groups or the two spaces together. Therefore, it can function either here or over here. So it can interact with B field, or it can interact with mass. All of them can be reduced to a single point called mass. Therefore, all fields can, are homotopic, and this is also through the paper, homotopic to mass. What does homotopic mean? It means that I cannot shape this glass mathematically to a coffee cup, but I can map or shape and stretch a coffee cup to a donut or, or any other ring. All right, when you've got ring magnets, they cannot topologically, um, they're not topologically similar or homotopic to a disc magnet. When you do this with fields, such as a magnet, you get interesting things in addition to the geometry. You get extra results, and I'll show one of them right here. This is a toy. I've started a company from this, one of the, ex one of the experiments. This is a little topology and magnets and, and why it's useful. In this little car, I have a, a disc magnet. It has no hole, though I could can use ring magnet. In here is another ring magnet. And the ring magnet has interesting properties where it doesn't have an axis of symmetry at the pole. It has axes of symmetry around the, rim, uh, around the ring, and then at the center, the pole is reversed. So if it's south around the rim or around the ring face, it'll be north pole at the center. When you, you get that, you get an interesting effect. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it, but I'll try. When bringing the magnet beyond a certain point, halfway on the ring, there it is expelled. Using stronger magnets, it can be expelled all the way across the floor. And I demonstrated some of these different sizes. I wouldn't say it's thrusting because it's not giving kickback. It's not giving recoil like you fire a gun. You can measure this. It actually, the, the uh, Newton said every action has an equal but opposite reaction. The reaction is the motion. Therefore, it doesn't give any kickback on the launcher. How can we describe this in another way? All right, imagine a ball, you're rolling up a wooden ramp, okay, and the incline is increasing exponentially. You get it to the top, if it falls back on your side, you're gonna feel the vibrations on the ramp. But if it falls over the edge, you don't, the ramp doesn't feel it. 
Therefore, it is independent. It is now a system. The ramp does not care if it's falling because it's not going to evolve it. Same thing with this. When it reaches that halfway point, it goes. What is that other field that is out there? Is the vacuum field, is the hypothesis, and it is being pulled out. It is not being pushed. Therefore, it doesn't have any kickback. Mathematically, this paper describes it <coughs> once you can map them all. And they did, and it was actually, it's very, um, very time consuming derivation, actually. But again, Z fields is the sum of all fields in space. And uh, it is also the space that glues all the other spaces together. And there is the mathematical result of that. By taking all of the dimensions, and I use the electron charge, I use known constants, so there's no question I didn't make any numbers. These are known uh, dimensions that, we, that I use to apply to these equations. And what you get is this. We get all the topological fields plus this. This is, this is a um, topological or net. And this is all dimensionless properties, uh, dimensionless. So you take, in, in the end, it amounts to uh, uh, the, the Lie fields. All right, so what does a topological net do? Well, in topology, you cannot always generalize, you know, all information between two topological spaces. You often need an extra function in the domain of natural numbers to generalize the equation. And that's what this is. In the end, it still amounts to all the Lie fields and a few dimensionless numbers. But it's actually, it's, it's very good. And add them all together, and you get this Z field. And by applying the values of electron charge, electron um, classic radius, and its mass, you actually get the value of that Z field in actual numbers. And you see that they do become equal. Because we can also calculate kilograms per second. All right, so here we got it. Composition of math, and this is the result. The composition of the math equals zero if and only if W in, in our uh, infinite series, W mod 3 equals 0. All the fields are modular and they all fit into those groups and therefore a Lagrangian is possible in order to describe the mechanics of all fields in space. You can describe anything. What is a Lagrangian? It is equation in classical dynamics. This would be describing the motion, um, the energy of the motions. You get potential energy minus you know, the kinetic energy. And it, you can apply this. People have been looking for this equation. This is significant because with this simple little equation, if it is represented from the other you know, equations and can be applied to the next equation, you can basically describe anything about any field, about any of its force, any of its action, anything based off of this. And how you do that is I just applied those fields, the Z field, such that, oh, I forgot the, uh, uh, anyway, L, equals the Z field. T equals the, uh, um, I, I use the Buckingham Pi theorem uh, in, the, in the paper, and uh, that, that gives the uh, um, topological net. But basically, it is the Lie fields, T, and then V is equal to the topological fields. And guess what? It does, you can apply that to uh, um, Euler's, uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation and start mapping the action of the Z field. What does that mean? What interacts in the vacuum field? In the electric field, we know it's electric charge. In magnetism, we know it's some form of current. In the A field, is directly the action is, is electric current. But what interacts in the vacuum field? You gotta know what interacts in it, otherwise you can't manifest it. And, and again, the action, if you consider mass as a field, which it does fit into this, that which it interacts with is acceleration. Okay, so, I had the, uh, um, this is a hypothesis for some time. And uh, why, why do I believe it is a hypothesis is because, well, the B field, A field, E field already follow this equation. And what it is is force divided by the field equals a negative charge. This will work in complex, in quaternions, in you know, flat mathematics, uh, you know, basic mathematics. Any form of mathematics or any complex or real number, anything, are you going to work with this? That was the hypothesis. Turns out from this paper, I was able to, to prove it because of all the math was already applied. And essentially what it's saying is that if you take these dimensions, you get the uh, action of the Z field is equal to a minus velocity when the force, or the field of force is the Z field. So that which interacts in the Z field is anything moving, any velocity. 
So it's present in the Bernoulli principle. It's present in airflow and airplanes. It's present all around us, but its action amounts to being a very, very small value. So we hardly ever see it, but it's all around. The energy, however, it's, it's a, a reservoir of energy infinite, or at least as infinite as the universe is. But once the Lagrangian is identified, the equation of the motion of a system can be attained with replacement of the expression the Lagrangian into the Euler Lagrange equation, which is satisfied by here, which then satisfies this. This is Q is the action, okay, and we get this groove. I'm not going to go over all of it unless you want to speak with me afterwards. I'd be happy to. But basically, we get a function of Q of T. This is the action. Remember, each little, what you do is you take, yeah, right here. You take uh, um, several instances, T, which are T are going to be individual fields in the abelian group or in the uh, Lie groups. So the B field is one T1. The, the A field is T2. The uh, electric field is T3. And what you do is you draw a graph of their values, and you draw the graph of L, which is the Z field we, we showed, against T. And then you measure the area under the curve, and the value that results from that area equals the action. This is an incredible uh, um, in mathematics uh, by one of my favorite mathematicians. I apply the fields to his mathematics, and here's kind of what the, uh, the area looks like. So basically, we, we take this area here, it's a rectangle, we get its dimensions, we know its values, the values are here, we take this area, we add it up, we basically start area adding up all of these areas, at, at point four, the area equals zero. In fact, every three, it's modular, ends up equaling zero. We take, oh, the rest are triangular, actually. This is the only odd thing, so it's easy to measure the area here. Now, this is not to scale. As you see, we've got 4.163, uh, you know, the power of minus 10, times 10 to the power of minus 16, and obviously, we have far larger numbers. But it's kind of condensed, condensed so you can see it on the graph. Mathematically, it's very easy to, if you know the, the, you know, the distances, to map the area. The area of that um, comes out, it came out equaling exactly the value of the Z field that was calculated from the previous experiment. Or it came out equaling the velocity, um, which is the action of the Z field. So this is the uh, um, equation of this velocity, the action minus the velocity, and the equation resulted in being you know, the natural logarithm, but uh, in, essentially it amounts to zero. That means this is the same as this. The action of the Z field is velocity. Where the velocity in the paper, I used some arbitrary, I said, well, let's imagine a wave traveling here and there so we can get some velocity to apply to these equations. But the, re the result of the, of the proof uh, ended up being that the action um, is equal to the exponent of velocity plus an error term. And, and this whole thing is in meters per second. Obviously, an error term is, uh, um, is, is a d dimensionless uh, property with some, some numbers. And they never drop too far below zero. It's, it's always right around you know one. So it, then it becomes uh, I'll go to the next page. But basically, these is uh, these are not ad hoc, ad hoc values. You know, these this is values you can pull up on the internet from electron charge, radius, and that. All right, let's get to the results. I'm going to skip through some of them because I want to get to the experiment. Okay, okay. Some of the results are we went over that, right? Yeah, so the Z field can not only be mapped uh, to or from B or any other field, but also B and E are, can be mapped, to, can borrow energy from the vacuum field. They all can and do. And I'll show you how to do it. This is the experimental setup. You use an inductor coil underneath there, and I put some ring magnets on the top, and I hooked a belt to them, hooked up the reversible motors, and each one of these should give power out, even though there's no wires between the inductor, the input power, to the motors out. You can add any number of them. You can make the magnets smaller and so you can fit more on the face. You can put them on the side. You can put them underneath. They all work the same. Each one of these systems are independent. So I can stop this one. This one's going to continue to run, and the power input's not going to change. All right, there. Each individual system's um, adding to the entire system. What you do is you, you increase the uh, efficiency out. Hook some um, leads out there, hook these in series. The power just keeps going up and up and up. Here's the pulse that I gave it. This is a simple square wave. This is not, not amplified at this point, so here's the zero line. And then what I did is I added an extra control. I wanted that when I add the frequency, to, to increase the frequency, 
um, the power would drop off. This would be done with a filter. So that at 25 hertz, the, free, the power input is gonna be pretty high. And it's gonna start dropping off at about 50, 60 to be so small that it wouldn't even get the magnets to move, okay? Obviously, I never even got up this far. But this shows linearly how the power input was designed to decrease with each iteration with frequency. After applying that filter and a few other things and amplifying it, this is the waveform that is sent to the coil. Uh, any waveform can be sent to the coil, actually, but this is the result of the, uh, um, this is the, result of the, uh, the filters. Here's zero, so it's, 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 it's pulse. At about 50 hertz, this amplitude, voltage and amps, are almost negligible going to the coil, and it still moves all of the motors. How did I measure it? All right, so I got a computer, and I amplify the signal while I see. But basically, I'm measuring just what's going to the coil, the inductor, and what is coming out from the motors. All right, so one measurement here, and one measurement here. And uh, I applied it over a 10 ohm resistive load, so it's the resistor. And that's my multimeter. Okay, that's measuring the voltage um, across the amps were measured in series, as it should be. I'll just put one in bit immature. The voltage out. Um, interesting behaviors happened when, when the magnets were wanting to get more energy out. Nature didn't want to do that, and so it would simply reverse the magnets the opposite ways so that it wouldn't need to expend greater energy. And if I turned around, if I had it in series, they'd reverse or one would stop. This many odd behaviors did not want to give more energy out. But what you do is you add a polarized capacitor between the two and just can't communicate with this system and the um, voltages became additive as well as the, uh, the current. So a simple polar capacitor or a diode or something is enough. I think, actually I tried diode, it didn't work. Capacitor is the way it does because it will store the energy and make these completely independent systems and therefore you can get them counter-rotating but wire them a certain way that they'll still be in series and additive. Okay, so amps out, this is where I measured it um, here, DC out. And basically what it is, is we're, I sent, as a lot of people measured uh, Thursday, the, uh, um, it's just with two motors, I have five motors on there. Um, a lot, as people measured, just with one motor, you're getting about 1.2 volts and, and some certain amps out, because they're very inefficient motors, but the voltage going in is, is negligible. I mean, you're talking 10 times over unity just with one motor. You start adding them together, it goes up exponentially. The final result with two motors was 44 times over unity. These are the frequencies applied to it and the duty cycles. For this experiment, the duty cycles did not affect the efficiency. In, in other words, the duty cycle does not affect the rotation. The rotation is the only thing that's measured. I didn't measure the power. I didn't take it from the inductor and use that power, add it back to the final measurement. I ignored it. I didn't take anything from the precession. I didn't take anything from the duty I only took energy out from the rotation. That means there's a lot more that's available. Um, here's how it did. Remember, the power in would diminish over, over uh, as the frequencies would increase, and uh, as you see, it, it does. At this point, the frequency, when you increase, the output power would go up, and then eventually the, uh, um, the, frequency, so the power would be so low, it would start to drop back down. This is how it went, and that's how it was designed, so that there was this region where you were going, well, actually, I didn't expect it to be increased, the efficiency did increase exponentially. Um, so there were a lot of new discoveries made with it, but this is the way it resulted. Here is the, uh, um, the power co coefficient, you can call it uh, you know, CP, which is common, or a coefficient of power. Uh, and, and essentially, this is where it came. And uh, um, here's with the number of uh, generators out and number of magnets. So applying many magnets to the system changes the over how one magnet will function but it's always advantage. It's always to its advantage. You're always going to end up getting more power out. It's uh, um, it's exponential. At the, at the at the height of it, there was one frequency where it was 44 point 44 times, and, and that didn't that uh, setup was for the experiment of just two motors. But this is how it works. This is the optimum range with the settings that I applied to it. And uh, um, this is just with two motors. I had five on there. So I got the 44 times I said I'm done. I don't want to go any further because no one's going to believe it anyway. So I figured I would 
I would stop at two motors because the fact that you can add any number of motors you want because it's all around the outside. Of you. So it's any number of motors you want to add is going to keep increasing. I got 44 times with two very inefficient $5 motors from Radio Shack. All right, so this is what the apparatus and the experiment provided. And for the uh, 44 times, that's you know 4,400%. And that's DC power in, DC power out, so you don't need to worry about reactive power, you don't need to worry about core measurements. It's pretty straightforward DC, and, uh, um, and that's why I chose the DC motors and the experimental design as this, so that there are very, very few assumptions and very many controls. If you read over the list of, of uh, controls, you will see. And, and this is what I also wanted to stop at too, because I wanted to demonstrate, if I stop at two, I, I would like some people's imagination to go, well, what more can we get from it? Um, a lot. In, in the end, it did not support my hypothesis in the sense that my hypothesis said that they would increase linear. They increased exponentially. The efficiency increased exponentially. And that was the final result, so I have to say, no, it wasn't what I thought. But uh, the power out did increase in a linear fashion, but because I was reducing the power in, it increased exponentially. So the magnets do increase the power out linearly. That was true. Okay, here's the video of the apparatus, and I'll be winding, wrapping it up very shortly if I can get this video to work. This is what it looks like if some of you missed it on Thursday. Oh, no speakers, so you can't hear it, but yeah, so it's just the uh, five motors that I used, and, and that's pretty much what it is. They all work, and they all work fine together, and, and that was at a very, very low power input. Okay, again, the power out was only taken by rotation. The precessional motion can be attained using bits of crystals and vibration. I actually went to our part of a few things at Radio Shack. Just put it in that two piezo crystals. I got to about four volts, so we're getting five, one volt out of just the motors, which are very efficient. Add a couple crystals on the side, vibrating against it, it adds bumps up to four volts. You can also make band -to -graph 